Well, it's the holiday season. Again. Um, just give me one second. Just need to double check something. Why is there an ad plate on here? Just get that. All right. Yeah. It's December. It's December. All right. So, I had to double check because... <laughs> I mean, I'm definitely not the only one that feels this way, but it feels like the 4th of July was just yesterday. Now it's December and I'm freezing my ass off. And you know when people say that Christmas sneaks up on you? They're not kidding about that. I can never fully prepare myself for it. So what am I gonna babble about this time? How about something that is slightly related, but mostly unrelated to Christmas? Good old Atari. The name that either makes you think of TV ping pong or... Whoa, man. It started off great for them, but this would only last a minute because of Murphy's Law. Murphy's a jerk. Atari put out a game on the 2600 during Christmas of 1982 that was so bad that not only was it a financial bomb for Atari, but this game is considered to be the worst video game ever. And it happened to be based on one of the best movies ever made. Well, tis the season, you're gonna find out about E.T. on the Atari 2600 on this holiday episode of Pointless History. Howard Scott Warshaw was a video game designer for Atari in the early 80s. He's famous for designing the games Yars Revenge, the game adaptations of Raiders of the Lost Ark, and E.T. Both Yars Revenge and the Raiders adaptation were successful games, Yars Revenge being one of the best-selling games on the 2600, and Raiders for being one of the few linear story Atari games that you can actually beat. Let's get sidetracked for one second and talk about the making of the Raiders Atari game. Atari was able to get the rights to make the Raiders game from Steven Spielberg himself. What just seemed to be perfect timing was that Warshaw was becoming one of Atari's best game designers around that time. He was given the job to create one of the first approved movie-based video games. No pressure. Right? It took him almost a year to make this game. Most of that time, he was cracking a bullwhip in the office. He definitely whipped it. Whip it good. The reason he was doing this was to get inspiration while making the game, kind of like a method actor when they really get into character. When Warshaw was done designing the game, he showed Spielberg the final product. To quote HSW, that's Howard Scott Warshaw abbreviated, he looks up at me and he says, it's just like a movie. I feel like I just watched a movie. And I thought, oh my God, Steven Spielberg thinks my adventure game is just like a movie. To me, that was the ultimate compliment I could possibly receive on this work. If only HSW knew what would happen next. In the summer of 1982, Spielberg would release the classic science fiction movie, E.T. the Extraterrestrial, the movie that made the toughest kids pour their eyes out. It became one of the highest grossing and greatest movies of all time. And because video games were popular, there had to be a game adaptation of the movie, and Stevie Boy knew who to contact. Spielberg had requested that I do E.T., so fine, I'm not gonna argue, Warshaw would say. But what had happened was the negotiations for E.T. had run very long. Spielberg and Atari were fighting over the rights and the financial crap of adapting E.T. into a video game. Eventually, it settled at the end of July 1982, and then the CEO of Atari decided to be a capital A <laughs> and give HSW only five weeks to develop the game from the ground up. Now that's ridiculous. Atari wanted the game done before the Christmas season. Ah! Oh my god! Hoping it would be the perfect Christmas gift for any Rugrat that liked the movie and played Atari games. Now just a reminder, it took HSW almost a year to create the Raiders game. 
How the hell was he going to create a game in just a little over a month? Well, with some luck and inspiration from the movie, he came up with the basic concept of the game in a little over a day. HSW then shared this concept with Spielberg, in which he replied, Couldn't you just do something like Pac-Man? I have this really funny feeling that this made HSW want to kick Spielberg in the throat. Thankfully, he didn't do this. Otherwise, we probably would not have got Jurassic Park. Luckily, an agreement was made, and the concept of the game was finalized. HSW went to work for five weeks on this game, even going so far to have a game development system brought to his home to work on it there. He would describe this process as the hardest five weeks of his life. He was probably hoping it would be worth it in the end, especially with a high anticipation for the game. It had to turn out fine. Right? The game loosely follows the plot of the movie. You play as E.T. and collect the three cosmic phone pieces to phone home. The pieces are scattered throughout the game in the pits. A way to find all the phone pieces without having to go through every pit, which I miserably did, before I found out that when this question mark symbol pops up, you're able to detect which pit has the phone piece. E.T.'s health, indicated by the large number down here, decreases when teleporting, falling into and levitating out of the pits, running, and walking. Why? To restore your health, you have to collect Reese's Pieces, slight inspiration from the movie. If you collect 9 Reese's Pieces, you can communicate telepathically with Elliot to get a phone piece for you. Any leftover Reese's will be added to your score. Once you have all the 3 phone pieces, you have to look for the Space Invader symbol. This will let you know to phone home. Must be good phone service in the area. The call is made, and a clock shows up to let you know that it's time to get the hell out of there and go back to the forest. AKA, the landing zone. You have to get there before the clock strikes zero and stand in a specific area in order for the ship to land. Eventually, it shows up and you leave this entropic planet that they call Earth. Now, it's easier said than done because the game decides to throw you some curveballs. You get a scientist after you for observation, aka a xenomorph prostate exam, and an FBI who takes parts of your phone and your Reese's pieces away. What a bunch of assholes! The poor alien is hungry and just wants to go home. Let him be. HSW went a little overboard and decided to have the game wrap around like the world. You can move E.T. in one direction, and it would eventually bring him back to his original destination. HSW decided to throw some easter eggs into the game. By collecting 7 Reese's pieces, calling Elliot to get them, getting all the phone pieces, and finding the flower, will turn the flower into Yar from Yar's Revenge. Doing this again, but making sure to get this phone piece that looks like the letter S, will turn the flower into Indiana Jones from the Raiders Atari game. Now this might be a little hard to believe, but the E.T. game was considered to be a commercial success outside of Atari, as far as sales. Even getting into Billboard's top 15 video game sales list from December 1982 to January 1983. By the end of 1982, over 2 million copies of E.T. were sold, which sounds like a great success, but in fact, it wasn't. Atari had a big ego and decided to make 5 million copies of the E.T. video game. Eventually, reality hit all those who got this game that Christmas, and E.T. games were returned and refunded by early 1983. Not only that, but there was an overabundance of unsold E.T. games. According to Ray Kazar, the CEO of Atari at the time, 3.5 million out of the 5 million produced E.T. games were refunded and unsold inventory that were eventually sent back to Atari. All of this, combined with unsold merchandise and the expensive license to make this movie-based game, was a financial defeat for Atari. Reviews for the game were slightly mixed. There were some good reviews about it, but it was outweighed by the bad reviews. The main complaint was the pits. You fall in them without even trying, or leaving the joystick unattended for that matter. Then trying to get out of it is a bitch. Alright, come on E.T., let's get you out of this pit. Come on, you're almost there. And, ah, oh, damn it. Alright, let's try this again. Come on. And, ah, oh, damn it, come on! God damn it, get the f up there! Ah, oh, you fucking klutzy alien! What is wrong with you? But with the combination of the scientists and FBI chasing after you, and E.T.'s decreasing health over every little thing that he does, makes for a challenging game. But now Atari was left with a boatload of refunded and unsold E.T. video games. What were they gonna do with them? 
Atari had a storehouse in El Paso, Texas full of unsold overstock and the E.T. games. They decided to channel their inner MSMFC and gave the E.T. games, as well as other unsold games, accessories, computers, and consoles, the casino treatment. In the early fall of 1983, reports started going around that Atari had this overstock taken to Alamogordo, New Mexico to be crushed and buried under concrete in a landfill. Obviously, it's absurd to believe, but stranger things have happened. Bystanders and news stations in the area would report about this event. That's gotta be depressing watching all that cool expensive stuff being buried. But that lovely attitude called skepticism was there as well to be a complete jackass. For a little over 30 years, there was some skepticism about this event, even getting the urban legend status. But then in 2013, someone got the bright idea and probably said, why don't we just go dig up the landfill and see if it's all there? In May 2013, the Alamogordo City Commission gave this media company called Fuel Industries permission to dig up the landfill. They took advantage of this opportunity and made a documentary about it called Atari Game Over. This wouldn't happen until April 26, 2014, and on that fateful day, they dug. And they dug. And they dug. Eventually, they were dug up. Better off digging this up than a deceased body. But E.T. wasn't the only game dug up that day, as well as other Atari stuff. So cool. The urban legend was proved right. It's crazy to think that this game was slightly responsible for this event. But you want to know what else kind of happened because of the E.T. video game? Only for a little while, though. Let's talk about that. Many believe that E.T. was the sole cause of the Great Depression of video games, aka the Game Crash of 1983. The truth is, it had a minor role in the Game Crash. The reality was an oversaturation of video games at the time, from Atari competing against other game consoles, to third-party developers making games for the 2600 that were a hit or a miss without permission from Atari. Atari would also release the Pac-Man port for the 2600, which was a big disappointment at the time. And they would also release the 5200, which was also a bomb because of the faulty controllers. Take all these factors, mix them together, and you get... A crash. E.T. on Atari has its frustrating moments, but looking past that, it's actually really innovative. Most Atari games during that time were about getting high scores and going through different levels of difficulty, or playing the same exact game on loop for all eternity. But E.T. and also Raiders cut the mold for linear story video games that would come. And kudos to Howard Scott Warshaw, it's a hell of an accomplishment to create both the greatest game and the worst game on the Atari. Speaking of HSW, he's actually a psychotherapist in this day and age. Probably got inspired to become one after earning this title. Is E.T. the worst video game ever made? Not really. It's fun to say that though. I mean, yeah, copies were refunded and buried in a landfill, but there's far worse video games that deserve to be buried in that landfill. You know, on second thought, they deserve to be buried in hell. But enough of this hell talk. Merry Christmas and happy holidays, you filthy animals, and have a happy new year.